to the meeting and sitting him at the table and placing his order and, and the shock value in that and how he wouldn't let the coroner take the body. He wanted to bury his father's body on his land, um, on his farm. Um, I, I thought that was so special um, just because who he was and, and everything that he had went through to, to keep his remains. And they weren't rich. They didn't own property at the time. But the, as a result of that civil lawsuit, he got that $2 million and he was able to buy that land that he grew up in. I thought that was that was pretty special. Um, I loved how he's intellectual himself. He took on that role of that nigger whisperer, <laughs> but that wasn't his calling. He was in the horticulture and animals. Um, and he took that and he made a name for himself, creating these oranges. I just ate a tangerine. I felt like I'm paying homage. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and, and the girlfriend, the love of his life that he grew up with, eventually he ends up with her, even though she's got four ghetto kids by a ghetto man. Like that acceptance. Um, and I was really like disappointed. I had to reread the last couple of chapters because I'm like, what happened? What happened? Did he get off? <laughs> Did he get acquitted? <laughs> but I think it, it, it ended up being implied that he was acquitted because he's remembering now the day of Ob Obama's inauguration and being out in the yard and, and that type of thing. So he clearly must have like not been charged, but I loved that he took this idea of segregation because I've said this personally, like mm -hmm. maybe desegregation didn't help us as much as we think it did. Um, mm. Maybe it took out that black community that we, that we really actually needed. We needed to have our own, we needed to have our own schools. I went to an all black Christian school from kindergarten to eighth grade that has since gone out of business but my experience from those developmental years of having black teachers, black administrators, black janitors, and my mom, I wouldn't say we were racist, but we weren't sensitive to the Mexicans that moved into our neighborhood. And if one of them tried to check into our school, we weren't trying to be ignorant and treat them different, but like their hair was different than ours. And as little girls with the hair of the texture of cotton, we found ourselves on the schoolyard always like playing in the Mexican girl's hair. Like that was just something we had never seen before because we were 100% black community going to black grocery stores. And I remember being 10 years old when the LA riots came through. I remember when they broke out, we were on the corner of um, Van Ness and Florence. And I remember the shooting. I remember everything that took place um, when my mom pulls me out of school. And then I remember going to the grocery store and it's not us looting. It was all of the Hispanics that were tearing down and burning down our grocery store. And I remember being angry and wanting to beat them up. And my uncles are angry about what happened with Rodney King, but they're more angry that these outsiders are now burning down our community and us wanting to protect what we had and ultimately losing it. Um, but it was, it was, a, it was, a, I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was a great comedy. <laughs> I thought it was true to LA the way I grew up in LA. Um, I loved, I, I always write down like these little quotes, like I'm going to use mm -hmm. them memes later. Um, but I love how he, he describes the black community as ABD, all but defeated. And in times like this, um, with COVID and, and all Black Lives Matter and everything that we're going through. At the end of the day, I was on the phone with my uncle and my uncle said the same thing. We're a resilient people. We've gone through so much um, and we're always underestimated, but we always somehow rise um, above the ashes. And so I'm, I, I'm glad that it's implied that he got off on this case <laughs> <laughs> for violating the 13th and 14th amendment. <laughs> and I love like Hominy, you know, he chose to be a slave. He's like, I want the freedom to choose to be your slave. And then as a slave, he sucks. He only worked from one o'clock to one fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know that guy. I just feel like I know that guy. He lived across the street from me. Um, <laughs> and so that non-essential essentialism and all these little small doses of knowledge, like I just, I love that. And so I just start collecting all these quotes I want to one day use in my own autobiography. And I thought, this is a really cool book. I, I see why you chose it.
well, I work at a bookstore and I had put the book on hold for the next day when I was going to pick it up. And I decided to, I got it for free online because um, I had a Kindle credit. So I put it back and the girl that I was working with was like, oh, nobody should ever read that book. It's absolutely the worst book I've ever read. And I looked at her and really? went, now this, now this is a, a white chick who runs around screaming Black Lives Matters. And this is the one thing I wanted to talk to you about, Breeze, about, you know, that I was telling you I had this person mm-hmm. that's like, so anyway, to not detract from that, but I was like, this must be the best book because like, I don't believe in anything she's ever offered people like, oh, you should read this. It's so great. And I'm like, God, I can't even think to read that book. It's so like, blah, you know, so, but I read it and um, I thought it was the greatest piece of absurdity. Like, you know, as far as um, you have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. If you've lived in LA, you kind of understand a little bit about what goes on there. I don't think she's ever been outside of like, you know, Southwestern New York or something. And, um, you know, she lives in the stick. So I think maybe she knows three black people, who knows, um, or people of color for that matter. But um, he, she, uh, as far as I, I laughed through the whole thing, I just saw the absurdity in it and the fact that, yeah, this can actually kind of go on and happen without us you know the white culture would never even know because most people who are white and don't know anything about any other culture but their own can't even see humor or look to identify anything within any black or colored culture you know Mm -hmm. so and I have a friend here in Buffalo like I was his one white friend and um we went to (laughs) we went to college together so he would school me on a lot of his black culture here in buffalo because his his family would look down like she's the dog on my friend and you're trying to be too white with her and because he was college educated so i was seeing some of um you know like how really smart i can't even remember what my lead guy's name so all i remember is the little rascals how many oh, they didn't act the narrator they never the did narrator, they never, they never gave him a name me. right so, yeah me So, um, you know, I saw bits and pieces and I, and I often wondered, well, you know, what are they really not saying to his face that they think about him? And some of the language that Paul Beatty had him, had his character use, I was like, this is a really smart, educated guy who can't really come out and say he's a smart, educated guy because nobody would totally understand the, the dumb, dumb donuts intellectuals really (laughs) had me giggling. But the fact that, like, I know where that Dum Dum Donuts is all the way here in Buffalo, because I lived in L.A. for a dozen years, kind of makes me giggle because I could I was trying to, like, put places together and and really, you know, it's really quite interesting. And it made me want to do an experiment and, like, go put lines on a street. And um, <laughs> you know, it was basically, though, the book was this huge social experiment. Yeah. So um, uh, I started the book almost as soon as it was announced because I didn't want to be in that rush state like I was with the other book. Like me right now. (laughs) Um, So, uh, so, um, uh, you know, I I decided to go the route of the audio book, which I'm really, really like, you know, it's like a whole new experience for me and I'm really, really liking. Um, I even, I liked the, the, uh, the, the, the actor they chose to read it even better than the previous one. And so I found myself um, listening to it when I would do my exercises or when I'm doing yoga, I'm putting it on the, the treadmill, the, the bicycle in the house. And I didn't follow the story as linear um, uh, as, as, as you did. Um, mm-hmm. so I found each chapter their own standalone stories for me. Um, but what I loved was his prose, his, the skill he, the, the skill in which he put words together. Uh, and the the biting satire of almost listening to um, that intelligent stand up. Some comedians were like, um, uh, "Who's the, the the white guy that died of a drug overdose?" Um, uh, ben, Lenny 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 Bruce. Bruce. Uh, Lenny Bruce. That storytelling aspect of stuff with such biting humor in each line made made it so engaging that I found myself enthralled in the poetry of his writing versus the, because I miss so many other, the elements that other people lined up and, and talked about. Like for me, 
Um, I really enjoyed the, the story of Hominy, but I didn't get a lot of the subtleties of his journey um, in terms of the story, in terms of like, I, I, I knew about the court thing. I saw what, a, what, a, what an asshole his father was, the super intelligent psychologist and what he did to the kid and the, the torture of him uh, uh, being electrocuted as he's answering these questions. Right. But what I found fascinating was the way in which he described everything was so was so interesting, which made the which made every time I would sit, plug it in, or turn it on in the car, or listen to it, it was like, oh, I'm going to get to hear this fabulous prose again. You know, like I didn't know that he. I missed the part about him carrying his father's body in after he died. I was just so fascinated with the story of the apples uh, and how he, <laughs> where he buried his father and how he, <laughs> about how he described the different kinds of apples made me go, wow, I didn't know apples could taste that differently from season to season, making me want to try out a winter apple versus a summer apple or an apple that tastes like a peach. Like, huh? Really? Um, so there was just, for me, there was just all these fascinating moments, but being a, um, a, a theater kid and a movie buff, I just simply was just enthralled with Hominy. I mean, I, every, I, I hung on to every word of this journey. And I, I told Breeze one time, I found myself wanting to go back and look at videos of uh, <laughs> just to see if Hominy existed because of the mm -hmm. way he wrote this person you were just like, like I was, I was that close to looking up Dickens, but I was like, oh no, it's just gotta be made up. It's just gotta be made up. But Hominy, I was like, wait a minute, I have watched these movies over and over again. And I, I would know if there was a Hominy up in there, but he made it so believable that that, that part of it, I enjoy. Um, I thank you Breeze for, you know, for posting the YouTube videos of the interview with the author, because that for me, after reading the book completely or listening to the book completely was a great way to review before the book club meeting was to hear the author speak about his book and hear the various interviews that he gave. So this morning I got up early and I just listened to all of the YouTube interviews of him. He's actually a horrible reader of his own work. <laughs> <laughs> but the but the but his thought process behind what he writes that was brilliant so you know two things stand out so he tells so he tells these two stories about how um how the book is a book of fiction but some things are based in fact so mm -hmm. when he talks about hominy trying to commit suicide he says i didn't know of a person who committed suicide but my sister knew of, you know, of an artist in the community. And I remember, Breeze, when we first moved to LA, remember that black guy that owned the coffee house that committed suicide? Do you remember him? No, no, no. But he had he had a black coffee house. Um, young guy, oh, I, I'm gonna come up with the name of it before. I mean, was it was it near the, the twins? Was it near there? Yes, it was near the Lamar Park area. It was a black owned, come on, oh, you know. Oh yeah, was it in, right in Lamar Park? God, um, Lucy yeah, there was. Oh, there oh, was. Like I'm saying, the twins were Lucy Floyd. Oh, well, it wasn't the twins. It was a black brother by himself. He owned a coffee house. Yeah. Well, one day, committed suicide. Well, Just, so, I don't remember. Was it in the middle of the block, close to chaos? I, 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 I God, I've only been there one time, and it was twenty. It was like 19, 18 years ago. Yeah, that, um, that might be it. I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, I can't. I but, can't. But go but ahead. Go he, ahead. He said it was based on, and I was like, and all of a sudden I said, oh my God, I remember that artist, that activist in the community that one day he just wrote a letter and killed himself in the cough, and boom, that was, and it was over. Oh my God. That go was ahead. just so fascinating for me because he pulled from real, and then the funniest thing was, um, the uh, the moment where he talks about the the stand up clubs and how the clubs are all black, and he talks about the comedian who tells the story, and you know you got these two white people that are sitting on the front, and they're just laughing away. And he was like, um, um, uh, this, "This isn't for you. Get out." And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and and he says it's based on a real story, and he says, "Oh, most people won't even know who the comedian is." 
and it's the uh, the guy from Bebe's Kids. Robin Harris. Robin yeah. Harris was the comedian who told the two white people, "This ain't for you. Get out." And they thought it was the joke, and they laughed. He says, "Oh no, 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 no! Get the fuck out!" Yeah. Get out. <laughs> yeah. I loved that moment in the you know, and I love I love hearing an author's process in terms of like you know the, the backstory to the mm -hmm. moment that you love in the book to be able to hear that. So um, uh, just just the fact that he uses the city. And for, you know, for people like us who've only been, I've been here 20 years, is that, you know, there are just parts of it that you just kind of go, oh, I know exactly where he's talking about. I know this because he makes these references, but he says, and he talks about the fact that he makes those references because that gives him a place because he's a map kid. So when you said the thing about being able to draw a line, he, uh, he very much likes to create this map because he puts his story in a place. But he doesn't worry whether you get it or whether you know where this is. He did that so that he gives his story a context of a sense of realism. Mm. So for us from Los Angeles, we're like, oh my God, I know where he's talking about. But there was a the woman who was interviewing was from England. She had never been to Los Angeles, but she got a context of the story because he so intricately laid down this map, which is a great tool for us writers is to know that you create, whether it's fiction or not, create a map, create a world for your story to live in, and people will follow it whether they know, whether they relate to the places or not, because it gives it a sense of realism. And that's that was another fascinating part about the book that I enjoyed. Oh, okay. I like the way it's written. I like the, the way the writer writes, and I like the stories. And I, you know, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't get past the first chapter. Okay, it's, it's a really you you got but, more but you got further I than like you other people are now. <laughs> but I, I I do like it and I downloaded it. Um, I get my things from the library. So mm -hmm. you know, and they're um, they're easy to access. But when I was finally able to get it, then it was pretty, you know, close to today. But I like the way it's written and I like this it's so thick with information was the other thing, the names, the phrases, the places, the people that, you know, I'd start reading and then it would take me off on a different tangent. It would remind me of these other things. And I, I somehow think that was maybe even intentional, the way the writer did that. So I, okay. I really want to read it, the rest of it. But this is fascinating what everyone's saying. Uh, I think it was Mara, is a woman named Mariposa, Mariposa? Thank you. Uh, I know she, uh, Passa, I think. Yeah. Passa. She got the bus driver. Off. Yeah, the bus driver. She got pissed off when they were talking about because she got pissed off when they were, they were talking about the way that uh, black authors describe black women in books and always referring to their complexion as some sort of uh, food, mm -hmm. yes. like yeah, dark chocolate that. or ginger. Which I, I, I found her commentary hilarious and insulting because I do that all the time and so it made me think like I might maybe I need to rethink the way I fucking work um <laughs> and also it, go, it kind of piggybacks off of this question I found uh, I'm gonna read it verbatim from the discussion guys it says what do you think of the white woman who utters this you're a beautiful woman who just happens to be black and you're too smart to not to know that it isn't race that's the problem but class what do you think of her statement and what do you think the author thinks of it so I wanted people to just discuss that. And I wanted to start with Jamie. Like, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I agree and I disagree. I think they're two separate issues and they go together. Um, uh, in the book, um, I think uh, Marpessa, she ends up going off on this lady and I would have went off on her too. Um, <laughs> it's the same response I'd have to someone who says all lives matter. And mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. just a... Uh, to be ignorant, to believe that color is not going to ever be an issue, um, I just, I just, it's always going to be an issue. Let's say there's only black people, like Blacktopia, right? We're going to find a way for the light skin and the dark skin to then fight, and there'll be elitism and whatever. Um, so, um, it, but there is a thing. Classism is a thing, and and um, we do it amongst ourselves. We do it across the races. Um, but I think both exist. 
um, both are a problem. Um, I liked that Marpessa wasn't stupid. She was stupid <laughs> on her own. Like mm -hmm. she was, you know, kind of ghetto and she clearly had like four kids and she was that LA chick that we all know one of those LA chicks, but she was smart, <laughs> she was sharp. She would cuss you out, but she's gonna make you think and she's not stupid. So I loved that. And um, yeah, I think the answer is both and neither. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, Dale, what, uh, what are your thoughts? You need me to repeat so, the question? Um, uh, it's interesting that you that you use that question because I, it was one of the things I was going to jump in and say was one of the um, one of the interviews you sent is the BBC interview with him, uh, another another white British guy. It, it comes up right after the 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 first link, and I was listening to that, and the author kind um, the um, the host of the BBC kind of asked the author a little bit of that kind of offensive question that kind of goes along that line. <clears throat> and Paul would respond, well, I hope that I'm a good author, not a black author. Like you keep trying to fine tune it down to black when basically I wanna answer it by saying uh, author. You know, so it's like, you know, it's like, don't just call me a beautiful black woman, just call me a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, that's the, and, and Paul would subtly correct this man. And he did it like three times in the interview. And I'd be like, mm. God damn, I want to smack this bitch so bad. You know? <laughs> it was like, and, and, and then Paul even said very subtly, I don't know if you've read the book kind of thing. <laughs> and, you know, because you're asking these questions like, I'm going to ask you these questions from an intellectual racial, you know, white man looking over the black problem kind of issue. And I need you to answer from your perspective as a black author. And Paul just kept quiet, very politely correcting him. Like, I'm a writer who's written about an experience and you get it or you don't get it, but you don't need to make me the speak all for black people person. Mm. which mm. is what I think is important in, in this writing. It's like, I've taken you to this world and I've given you this story, but don't make me the authority for all black people. You know, don't make her the representative of what, or the icon of what all beautiful black women are supposed to look like because we have beautiful women, period. Right, and right. That's how I answer the question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Madonna, what are, uh, what are your thoughts on... I'm scared. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, from with this question in specific, it's sort of like the different races, the different genders are supposed to play a certain role in society. And there's a stereotypical role that the white Anglo-Saxon looks at and, so, and pigeonholes people into, and there's a, 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 the just plain ignorant role of people going, oh, well, you know, okay, yeah, you're a beautiful lady. If you have to quantify it with a skin tone, with a race and ethnicity or religious affiliation, you are not looking at the person. You are looking at the race, the affiliation, whatever, and saying, among all the people I have looked at within that section of society, you're a good looking one, you know, it kind of cheapens it. And we, and mm -hmm. like Jamie said, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, and everybody has said actually, we should not have to assign the fact that your skin color makes you better or worse that, you know, you throwing in black lady doesn't help. You know, it's like mm -hmm. saying that, oh yeah, I know some black people. So it's okay if I say that kind of thing, you know, it, it cheapens it to me. It's sort of like almost a defense of it, defense of your own ignorance if you have to point out something more than just that they're beautiful. When gotcha. it's sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and not to piggyback something different, I wanted to actually talk about to me the, I guess the, I guess for me, the meat of the novel was when he brought in the, well, there's two things. Uh, when the idea of segregation, which I thought I totally forgot about that aspect of the book that he was um, 
sort of putting in an effort to like reinstill segregation, which I totally forgot about. And I just want to let it be known that this will not be a theme of the book club since this is the second book in a row. <laughs> that is, <laughs> I just sort of push in segregation. It's not, I, I don't agree with segregation. <laughs> hey, I, I wanted to comment on Jamie's comment about the segregation because okay. I too grew up um, in Virginia uh, during segregation and from elementary school to the sixth grade, I was in all black, an, an all black school, black, you know, teachers, you know, and there is a pro and con of that is that the, the aspect of being able to be entrenched in your culture adds such a wonderful sense of pride. The, the downside that we learned once we went to integrated school was like, oh my God, look, we've got new books now. Whereas before we had the old beat up books. So we had access to better resources once we had integration, but we lost some of the great culture that was there being able to grow up among black kids, black teachers, black administrators, to have a sense of, you know, black, black uh, what is it, black history week was so much more richer and important to us when we were in an all black school versus when it got filtered out and watered down by the time we went to integrated schools, even though we had access to more opportunities and you know newer books and better buildings so the the pro and cons of it are completely related to so that part of the segregation that he, that came out in the book was that was that rich part that i remembered as a kid going to cavalier manor elementary school in the all black was that you had such a greater sense of pride which made him a better nigger whisperer you know well, with that, with, with that said, if like knowing the background of this story, uh, I don't know if you can answer this, but knowing the background of the story, like if you were in that story, like if you were a resident of Dickens, would you support his efforts for the segregated school? Or would you be on Foy's side? I would think that's his name. Um, would, you know, would you, would you support it or would you be against it? I, I, I really would support it because he presents it in such a brilliant um, uh, analytical way that you realize that this is going to make this town special in its sense, especially if you do it, if you're, if you're a segregationalist and you know how to increase the resources of the community around you and to be able to make this that, um, what, what, what was that, that town that historically that everybody now is talking about we're all just learning was burnt down was the first black wall. Oh, uh, Rosewood. Uh, right. If we, mm. if, if we had enough forethought to know that if we, if we make this town the best uh, resources and the best financial, then why do we need to integrate if we've got all we need here and we're raising these brilliant kids and having these wonderful resources? So there's an argument in that that kind of leans towards, you know, and you know how, <laughs> Madonna, I, I, I want to apologize in advance, but you know, hey. <laughs> so, so many people say, well, look at all the other races. Notice how the, 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 the Jews or the Asians have been able to create the wealth of their community because they've been able to keep their culture and raise the, the, the community up within this. And where have we as Black people been able to do that? Because all we worry about is assimilating and going in integration. But when you have instances like Rosewood, where it's like, no, we're not worried about all of that. We're just going to raise up from the inside. You see that all we're doing is taking the same model that other races have done by completely making it all about their race to increase the wealth and increase the prosperity of the people that are involved. So. To answer your question, yes, I would have been down for that cause. Mm, all right, and uh, interesting. I gotta, I have to form an opinion because mm -hmm. I'm all over the place. So while I'm forming an opinion, I'm gonna bring it over to, to Jamie. <laughs> if you lived in Dickens, would you be on the narrator's side or would you be on, I wanna, his name is Foy, am I correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, would you be down for the Foy or would you be down for the narrator? Like, would you, would you support the, the segregationist aspect of it? Oh, absolutely. Yes. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, my girl. That's my girl. I'm a girl. <laughs> right. Like, no, no, Foy, go away. Foy is the sellout. 
You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I was for the segregation because it didn't keep it pretty much the best part for me was that the, the shop owners had the the choice of um, blacks, Mexicans, and Asians only, or no whites. So they segregated against the whites and not everybody else, which I thought was amusing. And if that would be like a really good social experiment of the day, because you want to see people freak out about not being able to go wherever they want to go. Mm -hmm. The white people who are, that's the white privilege. You know, we can mm -hmm. go anywhere. And I thought that was an interesting part of the segregation to leave the whites out only and let everybody else mingle, mm -hmm. come in, use the restaurant. I don't know, you know, it would be, if, if it bettered the culture of Dickens and, you know, motivated the people, then like with Dale, I agree, you know, you hang on to your culture and you bring people up within. And if that's what it's going to take, then go for it. You know, and I think, I, I also think Foy was the, uh, the bigger of the sellouts because he was one of those little rascals in the end anyway. Mm. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that part. Yeah, <clears throat> I've really got to think about it. I, um, because I'm not, I got to think about it because I um, because I'm a hippie. I'm a hippie, and so you know, I'm always about integration. This, I don't know. I'm I'm so afraid of of sounding like Foy, but I guess I'm for um, passive aggressive segregation. <laughs> <laughs> If that you makes find sense. that for us, please. <laughs> yeah, I'm confused. Um, say, for example, you have a community like um, Dickens that I think they said it was, it was predominantly black and brown. And okay. so um, if the educational system and the social system is all, all you know, if it's already, if the, if the culture and the texture and the way the city makeup is already made up of people of culture, I would say just go in that direction. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, I would not necessarily get on board of it, of, of campaigns that promote separation, um, if that makes sense. Like if we're all, if, like if all the schools already feel with black and brown people, um, if the employment is a uh, majority of black and brown people go, you know, go with that. Let's, let's continue that. Let's continue that culture. Let's, con let's, let's continue that. Let's investigate who we are. I'm not exactly sure if I would promote a campaign that would be like no white people, no Asians, no, no, I, I would rather just sort of keep going on in that direction and not promote, not promote the segregation aspect of it. Passively not argue against it, but just <laughs> quietly go with it. Passive aggressive segregation. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. Uh, uh, it feels very odd and off to have no whites, no like no whites, no Asians, whatever, no Russians on a restaurant. It, it seems, it does not sit well with me. But if you already have a restaurant that's already catering to brown and brown, brown and black people, just keep on catering to brown and black people, and then promote the promote the dishes that are specifically about the culture. Go, I guess, lead with that positivity and not necessarily promote the segregation part. But that, goes, I but that goes back to if you look at other communities like the uh, Asian community or the Jewish community, it's like they still have their culture. They ain't telling you you can't come in. They're just still raising above. So if you want to call it a passive aggressive way in, of being segregationist, they're still being segregationist. They're, they ain't saying you can't come in, but they certainly are bringing their own people up. Mm -hmm. I wonder, which is the thing, I wonder if, say for example, I um, used to go to uh, a Weight Watchers meeting in a very a prominent Jewish part of Los Angeles which because I am um, a little dense, I did not realize it was a Jewish part of the, <laughs> of the community. Um, I, just, I just thought it all was very weird that everybody's wearing hats all the time. Um, but I, I do know <laughs> that, you know, uh, the Jewish community is very, they're very tight knit and they're very, they're very proud of who they are. And, that's, and, and I guess for me personally, I, um, 
I applaud their efforts. I applaud their idea of keeping their culture strong. Like I don't see anything wrong with it. And with like what you were saying, Dale, like I don't see anything wrong with black people doing the same thing of let's promote who we are. Let's promote, let's promote who we are and what our culture is. And I do know, uh, and it's just from my experience that in, which is why I brought up the Weight Watchers meeting uh, and being in this very predominant Jewish community, it did, there was an overall energy of, the, without, without anything being said, but the energy was so strong of this space was meant for us. You know, like not necessarily no blacks, no whoever, whoever, but it was a this the energy of like, this is specifically made for us. And so I, I get the idea of of cultures and races reaffirming who they are and creating safe spaces for themselves and saying this is for us. I don't know if that is necessarily segregation. Uh, I think it is. I think it's a healthy form of segregation. Thank you. Okay. And it's necessary um, because we risk so often getting lost. For example, I love that he rode around on a horse. And in mm -hmm. LA, we yeah. know the watermelon man. If you grew up here, you know about that watermelon man in the watermelon truck. And he's selling watermelons walking around on a horse. Well, a lot of people don't know Easy E from Compton was a black cowboy. And they still, to this day, ride around horses in Compton. Um, like protecting those little, those little pieces of us. There used to be the Black Rodeo. That's when I met Easy. Mm -hmm. We would take field trips there. Um, it's gone now. Like we don't, we don't get that. We lose everything by trying to include everybody else all the time. Um, even when I get my hair braided, I'm mad. They call cornrows now boxer braids. No, cornrows. Like, don't, don't, <laughs> take, don't take ours and make it something else. Mm -hmm. It's ours. The Kardashians had a lot to do with that oh, mess. And Ronda Rousey and all and others. Um, so I get frustrated every day in my day life. Um, and then understanding what I, what I loved was and I've been thinking about this with all the defund the police and all of that. Um, change happens when all the community stakeholders come together. And when you look at this dumb, dumb intellectuals and I love Kang cuz. Everybody <laughs> knows Kang cuz. And the fact that he still goes to those meetings, he's not out, he's still out there banging and, and mm -hmm. doing what gang members do, but he recognizes his place um, at the table. And, and these people, when I was growing up, the, you know, rolling 60s gangster crib hood OGs oh, had more pull on us than the police. They protected us better than the police. And so they are a community stakeholder along with the, the pastor of the black church. It's everybody's, um, it's everybody's stake at the table that makes a community stronger. And so um, it sounds absurd and non-traditional and dysfunctional, but it's ours. And so that part, I think it's healthy segregation. And that's how you really build a community is everyone making those decisions that we're gonna do better and we're gonna build this and we're gonna meet every week at a donut shop and discuss what needs to happen. Yeah. yeah. So I wanna go back to uh, the, the other question I mentioned and since we're I'm talking with, since we're on Jamie, what, how did you feel about his inclusion of slavery, of including, of making Hominy a slave to the narrator? Um, just what are your, your thoughts on it? Did you, did you think it was funny? Did you think it was needed? Um, just what are your initial, what are your thoughts on it? I think, um, and it was voluntary, right? So how yeah, it was, it was completely voluntary. like, no, I wrote you a letter making you free. You are a free man as of this date. And I thought it was great towards the end. Um, after he finally gets these little rascal videos and I didn't think dude had them. I, did, I thought like maybe he was mistaken and he was just see now, but after <laughs> he finally watches these lost tapes and people are crying like, I can't believe you went through that. These gang members are crying because they're with him and they watched these tapes growing up. Um, he finally quit. He said, I quit being a slave. And I think that, that showed moment. something. That was yeah. a powerful yeah. That was so powerful. And maybe he was a slave to the entertainment industry which a lot of us are, right? Um, but I thought 
he had to be. And and the fact that he was a slave that didn't work, I thought was hilarious. Because <laughs> you question whether he really was a slave or we just used the word. So right. to even talk about whether we were offended, whether he was a slave, when it's like, girl, 15 <laughs> minutes. I mean, look, that's why we got to go back to that BDSM. I think he just enjoyed being beat more than he enjoyed being a slave. slave? When yeah, you think about his profession and the role he played and how that type of role is perceived, that's a beating. Like yeah. maybe he did love being beat mentally, physically, and emotionally. And now here he is, once he finally watched that last tape, he quit. Yeah. Wow. I love that. Foy's um, rewriting of the, I forgot the book. Uncle Tom he, Sawyer. Uncle, Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, of Tom Sawyer. Yeah. Tom, Tom Sawyer. Sawyer. Yeah. Right. When, there's a, there's when, a way with the, it's, it's, how did he spell it? Because see, I'm listening to the book. <laughs> S-O-A-R-E-R, -E like yeah. soaring high in the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, because he, he, he pronounced it so weird. I had to like rewind it and like, what is he calling this book? <laughs> and he took out all of the, the N-word out of the entire thing to, to make it more um, palatable for his grandchildren. And so one, I wanted to get what everybody's um, thought on that. But also with that, if you can work that into... Uh, as we're, we're closing down, because we're over an hour, how did this book affect you personally? How did it make you, did or did it did it affect you? Because it didn't have to. Uh, did it make you rethink race in any way? Did you make it, did it make you um, able to look at literature in a different way? Like if it affected you, how, and if it didn't, why not? And, and, and the removing of the N word in the literature. Um, only because Dale is on my screen right now. Let's start with Dale. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did want to jump in because you have to listen to that BBC interview because the the host asked um, asked the Paul. He said he asked him a very similar question about the use of the N word. And mm -hmm. Paul, like, because I tell you how irritating this host is, Paul said. He said, because, you know, I can't use the N-word. Or maybe people in Britain wouldn't even understand what the N-word means. And Paul very politely turned to him and he says, why can't you say it? Like, like and, and he turned the table on this guy, which I really, really, really loved. But the, um, uh, the, the, the constructs of the book d didn't have me looking at race any differently because the book itself um, really just kind of reinforces the kind of things that I follow on my social media, what I like on my social media. So for me, you know, the idea of listening to the book and then seeing the news and reading my feed, all of it kind of all blurred together. So for me, it was just a continuation of what I go through anyway as a Black man living in America. So it, uh, on one hand, I could say it just reinforces the everydays. So mm -hmm. a lot of it a lot of it even wasn't as ridiculous as it seems if you took the book and just said, oh, there's just some really ridiculous satire. When you see, when you read my feed, you say, well, there's a lot of ridiculous satire that's actually happening in the world right now. So was he that far from the truth? No. All right. All right. Uh, Jamie, uh, thoughts on the N-word? Thoughts on the book? Did it affect you one way or another? Um, yes. Um... Well, first on that, um, the guy, um, Foy, rewriting all these pieces of literature mm -hmm. and kind of making it his own, um, I think that just solidifies that he is that true sellout, um, mm -hmm. the one that invented that nickname, um, which we mentioned earlier. Um, I loved this book, um, particularly... I'm starting to write more. I've been taking all my old journals and putting things together. And I loved that the whole time or at parts, I'm like, is this a true story? Like I'm bouncing between fiction, nonfiction. Mm. It's universal, universally relatable. Um, someone growing up in LA, I'm like, I know him. I know him. <laughs> and Paul from England can be like, oh, that's Dickens. Like he placed it in a good environment. He built that scene. I loved that. Um, and just in general, I just felt like, you know, as black intellectuals, we're so misunderstood and we come from so many different walks of life and we, 
we, we all stumble upon Dickens at some point. And so I just, I love that. And as I continue to write and just explore and loosely base things on my own psychotic life, um, I, I'd, I'd use this as kind of my blueprint and, and kind of create that outline because I need my story to tell my LA as I know it. And so this was really cool. Sweet. Uh, Madonna. Yikes. Um... What was the question again? No, how it changed me. I thought of sometimes when I was much younger, ignorant, where I stuck my foot in the mouth at <laughs> wrong times, being um, inappropriately dropping the N-word, which is removed from my vocabulary completely, um, and the guilt I have of it, and mostly because you say things out of ignorance, and when it was cool back in the 70s, and when, when you're a little kid, you don't understand things, and there's a lot now where politically correct about, but there are certain things we need to not embrace. I grew up very ethnic Italian and you didn't call another Dago or you didn't outside of the Italian race, nobody called you a Dago and you didn't bash their head in, but you could say it within your own ethnicity. And there are certain things that are sacred like that, that like I live with some Polish friends now and it's like their whole culture is different than how I grew up. And I look at them like, what? It's weird for me because the culturalism of, um, you know, Western Europe has totally gone, you know, everybody's an American now. And I still hang tight to my Italian roots. And so I look at it from that standpoint of the black culture, the brown culture, other cultures, not white Anglo-Saxon, let's just say that they have to hold on to their roots because they often get squashed down or appropriated and that's not fair. So I'm babbling, aren't I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is why, this is why you're, making friends. Sense. you're making yeah. sense. But I am making sense. I'm, I'm bouncing different topics. I'm bouncing different topics, right. But also looking at the language he uses in my own writing, I'm, it, it did inspire me to write more and I did want to write a story about my own mental health um, and looking how um, you look at things, how people write. It's true. The more you read good writing and read good stories, the better writer you become. You, you see things that you want to incorporate and emulate. So I'm glad I read. I have so many things that I highlighted and underlined on my Kindle. Um, just the, the craziness of it all. And then I thought, you know, Every time I read Dickens as a city, and yes, I looked it up, it does not exist. It never did exist, like one of those Wikipedia things. Um, I kept thinking of Charles Dickens and Bleak House and how mm. downtrodden London was at the time he was writing and how almost downtrodden everybody wanted to remain to some extent in Dickens slash Los Angeles slash wherever it was, you know. Um, there's, there's, just, there's just so many nuggets in it that in an hour and a half, we could never get to it. But I, I do know a bus driver just like Marpessa who would have taken it into the beach. Um, I had a lot of fun with, uh, with that. But there's something in here about um, trying to, to color. It was, I can't tell you what page because it's like three hours and 14 minutes left in the book according to Kindle. But um, somebody's um, best-selling memoir, the guy from Detroit with a crazy white mother who didn't want her biracial children to be traumatized by the word black. And it's called The Color of Burnt Toast. He did this so often. It, it just so many things. It all came back to food again. Surprise. Um, <laughs> but it, just there's just so much. I can't even go on because I'm blathering because there's just so much to unpack from this that you can't do it in one sitting. But I'm glad I read it. I'm slightly changed because now I go into the store and we have like all those classics, Tom Sawyer and that when I walk in right as you walk in and I'm looking for Tom Sawyer and Uncle Tom's condo and laughing because I'm looking at the classics, <laughs> laughing because all I can think of boys rewriting of them. So there, stopping there. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to back it up. Jamie, did you say, did you say that it actually was, was the Dinka, that there like was a community? Rich, Richmond Farms, which is in Compton, like just south of the Compton Airport. A lot of people don't know they had an airport. There's an airport in Compton? Exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> that I know. That I know. It's, it's not a real, it's like a township, but it's not a city, right? 
Right, and exactly. It's like a neighborhood. It's in like Ladera Heights or- Okay. Oh, okay. I you gotcha. Know. Richmond Farms is not a place. Like Lamert Park, that's not a city. That's LA 9 No, it's a- Yeah. Right, yeah like right. little, I keep thinking little Ethiopia, little Somalia. Right. You know, because those are specifically, um, I want to say refugee named areas where- a town. That's not a city. Yeah. Yeah, it's those are little suburbs between, you know, the city. So I'm figuring Dickens probably in there somewhere. We just got overcome by somewhere. That would be that. If the, I know some of you guys took notes on on the book. So if you have any anything additional you wanted to say, um, like Madonna, did you have anything additional you want to say about the book? Because I know you took time. notes on it and stuff. <laughs> or anybody, <laughs> oh, I just wanted to open it up. <laughs> Like Jamie or, or uh, about to call Dale Donald. One of you two have to change your names. <laughs> Just call me D. Just call me D. <laughs> like Dale, did you do you have anything additional? Just to just to like thumbs up, thumbs down. Would you recommend? Oh, it? definitely, definitely a thumbs up. But I really wish we had another Oprah hour just to discuss the whole idea of a person wanting to be spanked, wanting to be. We did. We only touched on that, but that's a whole level that you and I know just being in the leather community about people making choices to want to be spanked or punished. So is, there, is, that, is that really slavery or is that a, just a different way of saying I need to release or I need to have some kind of control issue? Because the person becoming spanked isn't really a slave. Mm. They're making this choice to it's, be punished for something so that's i just wish we would have had more time to talk about that part i know well one uh we can still continue this conversation after i cut this off but i do <laughs> wanted to just interject really really quickly it's a combination. Lost, be lost to some <laughs> <laughs> but just re really quickly because it's funny because i actually <laughs> i just took a um a bdsm test just yesterday now that you mention it, just for shits and giggles, mm -hmm. and um, and just a lot of the and a lot of the questions. It's a really long questionnaire, and they were just sort of trying to assimilate like what on the spectrum of BDSM, where do you fall? And um, and FYI, I'm like FYI, I'm directly in the middle, which I thought was funny because I'm a Libra. But um, the, a lot of the questions um, were really geared towards, and I've, and I've talked to people who, I've, I've talked to owners and I've talked to slaves. And, um, and I've talked to actually of all ethnicities. And uh, there is a woman by the name of Melina Williams Haas, if you guys are interested, who is, I am a really big fan of, and she knocks me off my seat. She is actually a very, very proud slave of this uh, white German musician. Um, feel free to look her up. And, but she's uh, smart as a whip, uh, but just the idea that she falls in that category of a black female slave of a white Jew of German um, musician, because she falls in that category, I think people automatically throw a lot of labels on her. And if you ever have a conversation with her, she really intelligently explains what it's about as far as the dominant submissive relationship that happens between beings, between humans, um, that there's a world of difference between BDSM slavery and cattle slavery. And that the one thing that I'm a part of a group named Onyx, by the way, who I'm going to their event when this is over with, um, one of the things that, and Onyx is a fraternal group from men of color who are into the leather, leather scene. And the main thing that they promote within Onyx is, is consent. Um, because BDSM without consent is violence. So, the, the main Jenga block that is in BDSM relationships and activities is consent. Without the consent, it's, 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 uh, it's violence. That's, you call the police because someone is now attacking you. It's all about consent. So it, there, there's definitely some, definitely a larger conversation with, with like that Dale was talking about that. Um, and then and the word slavery. And, How many yeah, the word, asked for it? No, <laughs> what you say? How many asked for it? How many asked for it? But it's, I mean, technically he is still a slave. Um, it might seem a matter of um, semantics, but there are, there are voluntary slaves. But I think because us as African-Americans, um, at least I can only speak for me, like the word slave gets my, it gets my antenna up 
um, like what? You know, it's it's like I I, I, I kind of recoil at the word slave because of the connotations in this country. Um, but there is a but there is another uh, energy that belongs in it specifically within the BDSM community, and I think in this book he definitely crisscrosses, whereas he's actually a cattle slave and he's also a BDSM slave because he enjoys it. Um, he enjoys the physical aspect of it, and then he also and then and then people who are in I know I'm going well and too far, I feel I'm babbling, but people who are in BDSM relationships who consider themselves to be slaves. Um, there, there's control that's still had on both sides because what you do is you're giving up your will to someone else, which can be freeing if you're in that mindset. So the things that we worry about, like us worry about as far as um, money, rent, food, clothing, you're giving all that up for someone else to handle. So somebody else is handling all of that for you. They're taking care of your rent, they're taking care of your food, they're taking care of all of this stuff and then you serve them. Um, and that works for some people. I'm trying so hard not to be judgmental because, oh my God, it sounds weird. But, and, <laughs> but those relationships actually happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, they definitely um, sort of touch on that a little bit in the book, um, which we probably could go on an hour and a half. And I just wanted to mention that stuff. Um, and definitely if you want to continue the conversation online and, um, Okay, sorry, I got a text message. Um, but you can uh, definitely, if you want to continue the conversation online, you can feel free to write in some things. And I want to post, I want to like and post it on the Facebook page and the group and all that stuff. Um, but yes, and we can continue this after this is over for a little bit. But I just also wanted to uh, go last word. I want to give the last word to Jamie. Um, just your final thoughts about anything. Would you recommend it? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, yeah, your last thoughts. Yeah, super thumbs up. Um, every race has a motto I wrote down. Um, I love the Latin. My mom learned Latin in college at USC. So it was a part of my household too. Um, and I agree with this one and I'll end with it. For, for the poor, every day is casual Friday. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I just love that. Like I'm putting that on my cover. <laughs> <laughs> Every day is casual Friday. That's it. Thumbs up.